I'm speaking from a dressing room at the Queen's Theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue, and I'm happy to introduce as our castaway in Desert Island Disc this week, Marlena Dietrich. Miss Dietrich, we're dumping you very unsympathetically on this island. Could you face loneliness? Oh, yes. Oh, sure, if it would only be me alone there and nobody else suffering, I would be fine. Apart from loneliness, is there anything in the situation of a desert island that you'd be particularly frightened of? No, 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 no. I'm frightened of nothing. Have you a religious faith that would help you? Well, I don't think so because I think I'm too little that anything great Religious would bother with me. What would you be happiest to have got away from? Nothing. <laughs> now, you have these eight records that you've chosen. How did you set about choosing them? Are they chosen to remind you of the past or to give you strength? No, 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 no. Just when you asked me, I quickly thought of what I love best, and it's rather difficult for me because at the moment I'm not at home. Because when I'm at home, it's easier to recollect and look at things that I have and that I like. So I quickly had to think, and the first thing that came to my mind was naturally Stravinsky, who is one of the great idols of my life. Uh, Sacré du Pantin, which I have always had with me. I never travel without it. And uh, when I met him, I told him that, and I told him I loved most the part where the girl runs away from the man in the woods, and he looked at me and he said, I've never written any such thing. And I said, but that's how the music sounds. And he said, well, if it sounds like that to you, that's fine, but that's not at all what I meant. But I still um, think that when I hear the music, and I always carry it with me, and I love the record most that he conducted himself. So it sounds strange because uh, you asked me something different and something of today. So I say I love very much a record that Bert Backrack has written a song for and the arrangement. And it's called There's Always Something to Remind Me. And it's sung by Sandy Shaw. And Bert Bacharach is your musical director? Yes, he is not only my musical director, but he is the arranger naturally, the conductor here at the Queen's. And he's also a great friend of mine, and he's also an absolutely wonderful man. It's a very rewarding partnership. Let's listen to the song of his, sung by Sandy Shaw. <laughs> Sandy Shaw. Miss Dietrich, you were born in Berlin. Yes, I am. I believe you come from a, a military family. Mm-hmm. And as a little girl, your upbringing was rather Spartan. Well, I think it sounds Spartan to most of the world. I don't think it sounds Spartan to English people at all. I think the English and the Germans of that time were very similar in upbringing. Cold baths and all that sort of thing. Yes, sure. And not take yourself too seriously. What was it your first ambition to be? Well, I don't think I had any ambition even then. I don't have any now. My ambition, or if you can call it that, my education was to be a useful human being, and that's what I've tried to be. You did study as, as a concert violinist, I believe. No, I started as, an, as a violinist, and then yes. they thought I could be one, and then I practiced the Bach solo sonatas. Uh, like I always do everything in excess, I did too much of that, and I injured my fourth finger of my left hand, and I, in those days they put you in a cast, and... Uh, 
when I came out of the class, they told me that I couldn't have a last concert, and um, I gave up the violin, much to the distress of my mother, because she had thought that I would be a violinist, but even then I hated uh, doing things in halves, and so I said, if I ever can't play a concert, I'll give it up now. Was that a great blow to you? Yes. So you decided to act instead? No, I didn't. It uh, sort of came later. I wrote a lot of poetry then, and I thought, well, something was so beautiful, the Hoffman style I read then, mm -hmm. that it would be nice to say it up on the stage or wherever people could hear it, and uh, this is what led me to the theater. Did your family like the idea of your going into the theater? No, not at all, actually. No family likes that children go into the theater. Is that true? Yes. Uh, you changed your name. Is Marlena? No, my name, my name Magdalena. is not changed at all. My name is Mary Magdalene, and it was pulled together, the M-E-R of Mary and Magdalene from Magdalene, the L-E-N-E, -E. Yes. And it was done by my mother because Mary Magdalene was too long for school and she didn't want me to be called just by the first name or the second name. So she pulled the two names together. And there are now thousands of Marlenas all named after you. Well, I think it's a very old, old, old German name. How did you start in the theater? What, did, you, did you go to a, a drama academy? Yes, I went to the Reinhardt School. What was your first professional appearance? My first professional appearance was as the widow in the fifth act of The Taming of the Shrew. That's a very tiny part of me. Yes. Then plays and musical comedies and reviews. You were in a play by Bernard Shaw in Berlin, I believe. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was. And you made a number of films playing leading parts. In fact, your career was getting along very well. And then there was one engagement that gave you international success, The Blue Angel. No, that's not true. My career was not going well at all. The Blue Angel was the very first film I made. Mm -hmm. And you made this film in three versions? No, in two. Two. In German and in English. Oh, Josef von Sternberg was a, a very distinguished director. Had you any inkling when you made this film that it was going to turn out to be one of the great no, films? No, no, no. Nobody knew this, not even the director. I don't think anybody knows when they're making a masterpiece. Shall we have your third record now? What shall we have next? Well, sh shall we have Richter? By all means. Who is my favorite pianist, and I met him when I was in Edinburgh. And he was so kind, and he came to see my show, because I had seen all his shows in the afternoon. I was playing myself in the evening. And he came to my table where I was eating dinner, and he had a rose in his hand, and he gave it to me. And I, I got up, and I didn't know what to do at all. He was so good to me. Well, Easter has always been my great god, as, as long as I know his records. And um, I love everything he plays, naturally. <laughs> but I love most Schumann, Schubert, Brahms. But you say, I can't take that many records to the island. So I'll choose one. I can't choose one. Let's put them all in a basket. We'll, we'll deal with this when we come to the luxury later. Choose one for the time being. Well, let's choose Beethoven then. Sviatoslav Richter playing Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata. Miss Deeply, as a result of your great success in the Blue Angel, you were whisked off to Hollywood and given the full Hollywood treatment. Did you go there with the intention of staying a long time? No. Out of all those Hollywood films, Morocco, Scarlet Empress, Desire, Destry Rides Again, there are so many. Which ones do you look back on with the most affection? Well, I cannot say that I look at anyone with affection. Because making films is a very difficult task, particularly for me, because I always had to play parts that had nothing to do with me at all. Mm. And it was a... Uh, isn't the job to an actress? No, no. I, 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 I'm not an actress in that sense of the word. I don't like challenges at all. I was thrown into this business and I tried to do my best and uh, it was hard work all along the line. You made many of your early films with Sternberg, a very productive partnership. After him, with which director did you work best? Billy Wilder. You made one film in, in Britain in the 30s. That was the first time you 
came and saw us, wasn't it? Yes, I, I played uh, in a film that Mr. Hitchcock made called Stage Fight. Yes. And then afterwards I made a picture here called No Highway. But you would not return to Berlin to work under the Nazi regime? No, I did not. You had by now become an American citizen. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the war came, and for three years you traveled the world from Anzio to the Aleutians, entertaining the United States forces often under the run. Not only the United States, I understand many British troops. This is true. All the Allied troops. It must have been a heartbreaking time for you with your natural affection for your own people in the back of your mind. No, it was not. It was not a heartbreaking time. I, I did what I thought was right, and I did the best I could. Well, it was work that your new country recognized with the highest civilian award. After the war, more films in Hollywood and France and this country, then you decided on, on a new career as a solo artist, first cabaret in Las Vegas and London. You made a sensational success when you appeared at the Café de Paris in London with a, a different celebrity to introduce to every night. Yes, wasn't that wonderful? I think the most famous people the English, because in no other country the great actors would have done that. I never believed it that uh, Mr. Guinness and Mr. Schofield and they all would come and introduce me in the cavalry. I never believed it until I saw them. And from all of them, it was from the heart. <laughs> and now you play a whole evening's entertainment on your own in the theater. Yes, I do. Well, before we talk about that anymore, let's have your fourth record. What have you chosen next? Well, let's stay with Beethoven and play the third, conducted by Toscanini. An excerpt from Beethoven's Third Symphony, conducted by Arturo Toscanini. Miss Dietrich, where is your home now? Well, that's everywhere. New York, Paris, all over. Yeah. This new profession of yours in which you give a whole evening's entertainment must be a very exacting and exhausting one. No, I love it. I love it more than making films or anything else except records. I do love to make records. Mm. But I like this profession very much. You sing some of your old songs and some new ones. What must a song have for you to choose it? Well, I think the lyrics matter most because um, as I'm not a singer, I need the words very much to give expression to the song. And um, I just wish I could sing some more songs by Bert Backright because he's such a popular composer. Well, I'm sure I have, get a word for you. <laughs> well, I have done one song of his on a record, but I've only done it in German. But there's a record out of it. It's called Message to Martha. And Adam Faith made it, and it's a wonderful song. Message to Martha, sung by Adam Faith. In how many countries have you given your one-woman entertainment now? Oh, in almost every country, except I haven't been in Japan yet, nor in Australia. That must have been an emotional moment when the curtain went up for you again on a Berlin audience after all those years. I know that you were an equal success there with Paris, Moscow, and everywhere else. No, it wasn't a particularly emotional moment, no. You said you had no ambition, Miss Dietrich, but isn't there anything that you want anywhere you want to play? Do you want to direct? Do you want to create in any way? No. You're just no. happy with the pattern as it is? Well, I'm very happy here in London at the Queen's, and I wish it could last forever, but it doesn't. And I love Edinburgh, too. I want to say this again and again and again. I love Edinburgh. Fine. Let's have record number six now. Reach out for me by Dion Warwick. When you go to Russia. Reach out for me by Dion Warwick. Now, you have renowned Miss Dietrich as a symbol of, of glamour. How about the practical side of life? Are you a good cook? No, I yes. Have you ever camped out? Well, no, I wasn't forced to. I don't see any reason to camp out if you don't have to. But oh. if I would have to, I probably would be able to. You could, you think, on a desert island, live off the land? Yes, I eat very little. And have you ever fished? 
Oh, I love fishing. Don't start me on that. We have no time. <laughs> Could you cultivate? Do you like gardening? Yes, uh, I like anything you do with your hands. If you acquired some form of craft, say a raft, would you try to escape or would you sit it out on this island? Well, I think I would sit it out. You know, I have patience, you see. More patience than navigational skills. That is right, because I don't do anything I know nothing about. That oh. makes me very happy, you see. I'm not frustrated. Let's have record number seven. Well, record number seven would be Waltz, Ravel. Part of Ravel's La Valls, played once again by the New York Philharmonic, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. What's number eight? Now, number eight, I think, should be uh, L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, Ravel. You're not going to take one of your own records with you. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 I never, li I never listen to my own records, no. No, I don't think anybody who has ever done anything or created anything likes to look at it. I have never seen a painter who likes to look at his own painting. I think it's for the other people to listen to as they like it. Yeah. Which part of L'Enfant et Sortilèges would you like to hear? Well, you choose it, all right. How about the cat duet? The cat duet from Ravel's L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, conducted by Lauren Marshall. If you could only have one of those eight records, which would it be? Sacré du printemps. And you're allowed to take one luxury with you to this island. What are you choosing? Well, it depends what you mean with luxury. I mean, something that uh, means absolutely nothing to anybody else, is that it? Something that means something to you, but isn't going to help you materially to live well, on the island. I tell you what I will take. Uh, I take it with me wherever I go. It's a little bunch of white heather that I received in Edinburgh. Mm. Um, that the people of Scotland brought me, and I take it with me wherever I go. And then I have a pair of ballet shoes that I received in Moscow. The children from the Bolshoi Ballet School gave it to me. And I have those with me all the time. And well, I probably will grab them and take them all right. We put those in the box. And then what? What well, else? Well, what else? Do you want anything else in the box? Your, your demands have been very modest. Please, may I have the wish to record? What, all of them? Well, all of them, yes. It's well, difficult to make a choice. I said you would have something else in the box, so you will have the list of records. And one book to take with you. One book. Uh, that's Konstantin Postovsky, The Story of a Life, mm -hmm. and a short story. I wish I could have that, too. Can I? Couldn't you make an exception for me, please? Yes. There's a short story that he wrote, which is called The Telegram. We'll slip that into the back Slip of the that in, because it's the most beautiful short story ever written. It's the most beautiful love story to a mother ever written. And he's a modern Russian writer, is he not? Well, he's not that modern. He is probably by now, I should say, 65. But he's so. still with us. Oh, yes. He was here in London. Okay. Well, thank you, Marlene Dietrich, for letting us hear your choice of Desert Island Discs. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. You've been listening to a download from the Desert Island Discs archive. For more downloads, please visit the Radio 4 website. The guest in today's recorded program was Marlena Dietrich. The interviewer was Roy Plumley, and the producer, Monica Chapman.